Welcome back to the stream. Anybody who's joining in early? As always, we've got the star of the show hanging out. I wonder if this camera is as focused as it could be. Hey, Kat. So this project is pretty much entirely related to the cat. We're continuing to build a robot that can follow this cat around with a camera and some sensors for a, you know, a viewer interactive cat camera experience. So I think the first order of business here is to try out the part that we designed on the last stream. So, looks like the 3D printer is done with that. The printer in the back is still making another high train. <laughs> so the printer in the back is still making another one of these bolt toys. Uh, this time the bolt is for me. Usually the bolts are for my cat, but I guess I like bolts too as long as they're large enough. Um, and the front printer was working on that piece that we did last time. Actually, that was the second attempt. I'll show you the first attempt and what I changed, but it looks like this one worked out, so I will go grab that off the printer and be right back. Hey, Tuco, are you going to make a mess of everything on my desk while I'm gone? So the first print had a lot of trouble with warping. Yeah, I'm just checking on the stream. It looks like things are streaming all right. So fresh out of the printer. Let's uh, get this camera going. Oh yeah, the, the cat leave when I went to the, get uh, the print. Hey, Tooth, come back in here. Are you still going to be in the closet? Hey, Tooth, where are you? Oh, <laughs> he is, uh, he is eating. Oh, well, he was. Hey, Tooth. Do you want a bolt, Tuka? I know he likes the nylon bolts from McMaster, but I'm trying to see if he will be consistently into these blue PLA bolts that I printed recently. I think he likes them. Duke, what do you think about this one? Is that a bad throw?
needs you go, you push it over there. How was that? Was that a good play experience? How would you rate that one scale of now to now? Whoa. All right, Duke, you want a nylon bolt? Would you like a precision engineered bolt straight from McMaster Car? Well, not straight from McMaster Car. It's been around this apartment quite a lot, but. Oh, he really likes those. Like, I think, he, I think he'll kind of go along with the PLA bolts, but he really likes the nylon bolts. Man, this cat is very, he has expensive tastes in plastics. Oh, Tico, you're so cute, though. He's just so happy when I get a fresh bag of bolts for him from McMaster. Mm -hmm. I have to get him some more because he's managed to lose so many of these so far. Oh. Uh, Alfie says hello in chat. Uh, they're currently fixing a cassette deck right now. Cool. Oh, and then Andy is saying, uh, so I'm still visualizing the Tuco flyer. Will it swoop all over the shop like those sports cameras? Yeah, that's pretty much the idea. I, I am not really that into sports ball, so I don't know that much about these cameras, but when I started describing, well, like, I, I think this idea originally came from someone who had seen these in sports ball and they were visiting my apartment or my shop here and saying like, oh, this would be perfect for your space. And then I thought about it for a while. And, and then so other people have suggested similar things. And so I think this is just a general thing that people who watch sports ball probably know about. the desk camera going again. All right, it's not quite time for the close-up on the calipers necessarily. Oh, and Alfie is asking whether I've tried printing Tuco nylon bolts. So I've never tried, and that's a really good question, I've never tried printing in nylon on any of my printers. Um, yeah, I'm forgetting off the top of my head what you need in your printer for nylon. Because um, if I remembered right, it helps to have a heated bed and a hot end that can handle really high temperatures. And the thing is, I, like my Type A printer, can its hot end can go pretty hot, but it doesn't have a heated bed. And then, you know, I've got the opposite with my Delta printer. So I don't know if I can do nylon, but that might be worth finding out. Hey, Duco, I know you like those, but I want you to choose one. Oh yeah, so um, this mess on my desk here. So uh, some of you might not be familiar with this stuff that exists, so black hot glue. I first heard about this from Applied Science, uh, Ben Krasnow. He meant, he, I think he's got like a whole, a whole video on just like hot glue tips and tricks. And he's got some really good stuff in there that I wouldn't have really thought of. Like, well, I think I'd thought of using stuff like um, like, you know, we found some stuff, like, co-discovered, like, um, I think I had also used the upside down. No, maybe I'm, no, I think, I, I think he gets credit for that one. Anyway, I thought there was some overlap, but he had some really good suggestions. And, yeah, two of the things that I think I learned from him were, you know, if you want hot glue to be even quicker and even dirtier, you can use, like, cold spray, like an upside down air can, basically, to, uh, to sh freeze it off really quickly. You could probably also use... Uh, Compressed air, like I should try my air compressor and see if I can get a similar effect. It probably wouldn't be as fast, but. And then I also learned about black hot glue. Oops. And 
I've got this in a different hot glue gun because you have to kind of purge it through to get all the pigment out because this is really heavily, heavily loaded with pigment, it turns out. Um, so yeah, because of that, it's very densely pigmented. You can use it as light insulation pretty effectively. Um, and it's, you know, non-conductive, unlike using foil for light insulation. So like, for example, that's a thin little puddle of this stuff and pretty bright flashlight. Here's a bigger piece. And you just don't see any light through that. It's very heavily loaded. Um, and you can take it off with isopropyl alcohol, just like you can with regular hot glue. Although, as you can see, sometimes you can make a mess by leaving some of the pigments and some a little bit of glue residue behind. And I think you can still get this off with more isopropanol, but I've definitely got a couple of stains on my desk, which I think I can attribute to using this stuff because it is so heavily pigmented. Um, over there. Take a... You're still deciding. Isn't that adorable? Oh, did you pick that blue one or was it just already out? Oh, what, what kind of bolt was that that you just, oh, that was a red one? Did you grab that one on purpose? Let's see. You wanna play with this one, Tico? Oh, you th you don't, you're waiting for me to throw it. It's over here. Ready? Ready? You just don't like the way that one sounds. <laughs> oh, too. You want an Allen bolt? Here. I should also just try printing some much heavier PLA bolts, like really dense infill and see if that helps. I think I did that before and it helped. Oh, that one went under the cabinet and you didn't like it. Double loss. Okay, Tuco, I'm officially confused. I'm gonna go back to cleaning my desk. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, not necessarily as easy a cleanup as the other stuff. But anyway, this particular hot glue gun will give me a relatively small stream of this. So I'm going to put this on the circuit board just in the areas I need it for light blocking, and then hopefully not leave myself too little room for the plastic bracket that has to go on top. So, yeah, this has been making little little emoji puddles of, of very thick hot glue here. Let's put another one in. Okay, interesting. So Alfie mentions in chat that they've seen some people print, that the nylon does need really hot temperatures, but they've seen it work pretty well with just a glass bed and glue stick. So actually, I guess it sounds like nylon might work out on my type A printer. Maybe I'll get a little bit of filament and see if I can try that. So yeah, basically I'm trying to s make sure that I can get a consistent, very thin stream of this for laying down like a bead for light insulation. And I can get this off with isopropanol. Maybe it'll leave a little bit of a stain, but that's fine. This is a work desk. Um, so I think the first step is to get the wiring out of the way so I can apply this. Adjust the camera angle here. This bracket is replacing the tape. The tape should come off for good. Carefully. And the bracket will hopefully organize this wiring a little bit. This is power and signal for the LiDAR sensor. 
power and signal for the camera. It's pretty much what you'd expect. And then this big connector that I'm leaving open is for a temporary attachment of the rather bulky control joystick that you can use to work the on-screen menus on this camera. But I don't want to have to leave that on when it's just hanging out on the gimbal. This is a tool, for, or this is a job for a different tool, like a little side cutter doodad thing. I don't think I can really unwrap the tape easily right now, so cutting the tape very carefully without messing up the wiring seems like the thing to do. Oh, one, so one key insight from the last stream that I should mention, I think this came from a lot of discussion, but like in particular, I think, I think uh, US Water Rockets in chat had a lot of really interesting ideas that led to this. Um, and somebody suggested, uh, well, so we were, this is in reference to what kind of apparatus attaches the, um, the paracord that the robot's hanging from to the, the measurement pulley that, um, which is responsible for measuring both the force and the movement on the cord. So it measures movement using a shaft encoder attached to the pulley, and it measures force um, by having the pulley itself on a load cell. So one problem that I hadn't quite solved with that was, well, how do you keep the cord in contact with that pulley? And so I'd been assuming I would use some kind of additional roller on a spring that would just kind of press the cord on there. But then, um, you know, then there was the suggestion to like wrap the cord around the pulley multiple times, um, which I was worried about that causing too much additional friction, like if the cord crossed over itself. So then we were thinking about like, well, what kind of pulley shapes would keep that together? And like, what is this problem actually called? Because like, I'm sure I'm not the first one to have to solve this problem. And so. Yeah, so then somebody suggested, uh, I guess they're, they're like um, maritime capstans. So usually this is a contraption. So like if you think of this from like a maritime, uh, like, you know, boats kind of con uh, context, it's like a big drum that you would use to wind a rope. So actually a lot like the winch that we're using. Um, and I guess the winch could be thought of as a capstan also. But then I think from a, like my understanding of the more like physics uh, context that you would find this in is that it's it's like a relationship between like rotation on a shaft and a differential in tension on two ropes that are coming into this this kind of pulley-ish contraption. And so anyway, that that kind of started pointing me in the right direction toward like well, what shapes do people actually make these out of? And and so yeah, I think I think what it makes sense is to design a a piece for this that's effectively a capstan. So it'll look like a pulley that's just kind of wide and has room for a couple of turns. And it can't have any features to keep those turns in place because that would then just act like a screw that would push the cord off of the pulley. But it can just be the right shape such that the cord only has room for the right number of turns and the turns hopefully stay in place with minimal friction against each other. So with that, that would basically convert all of, well, convert some portion of the the tension from the robot's weight on this cord into a uh, kind of force that applies 
that keeps friction between the cord and this cap stand so that it would then make sure that the encoder turns uh, you know, any time the cord moves and they don't slip relative to each other. Here you go. Oh, there's a whole bunch of chat that I haven't been keeping up on. And now there's a cat on my desk, which is slightly in the way, but he's so cute. You want off, don't you? Yeah, you're gonna stand on every keyboard you can get your hands on. All right. Um, mouse. Where's the mouse? Whoa. Maybe there's no room for that anywhere except exactly where it was. I can really hear the Delta printer in here. It's much louder than the other one. Um. Oh, welcome back, U.S. Water Rockets uh, in chat. We were just mentioning that you had a lot of helpful suggestions yesterday. Okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this, me too. I pretty much always have to write down a bunch of stuff, like, oh, I've got to make sure to do all these things. Um... Oh, yeah, that's interesting too. So yeah, the this camera that I'm using is basically like a surveillance camera that happens to have a decent lens and sensor on it and SDI out, which lets me run the video over coax relatively easily. So yeah, so what Alfie is saying in chat there is that this thread that the whole lens assembly goes into is just like an M12 metric thread and that this whole assembly is interchangeable. So that might be a thing to do, is find a motorized version of this if I want to upgrade this with, um, with motorized zoom later. Because that could be neat. <laughs> this is already having trouble moving around now that I took the tape off of the wiring. Because this wiring doesn't really have room to stay put. But yeah, no, that could, be, that could work. And this camera circuit board already seems to have connectors to, uh, to mount motors and that sort of thing. So what is nice is that the setup that we have here requires very little modification. Like pretty much all I've done is soldered on power to the camera. I'm still using the original coax for the video. And the only reason I soldered on power was that, that was, you know, an alternative that saves space and increases a little bit of flexibility versus having to put something in that connector that would have kind of plugged it up. So this way I can leave that connector open. I can leave a cutout for it in this piece that we just designed before. And then I can plug in the little joystick breakout there. Oh, so yeah, maybe let's look at the 3D printer pieces before we get too deep into the hot glue gooping. Um, this was the first one. Can we focus that? Oh, this is manual focus. We are not even servo AF. Okay, so this was printed with a brim, but no other like raft or anything, and no support. Well, and you can see the supports here. The supports are very thin, and I can take them off here. And the supports mostly worked, but the main problem with this print is that the whole thing is actually very warped. So especially you can see that this mounting ear right there and this mounting ear, like those are supposed to lie flat against a circuit board and the whole thing just kind of turned into a big old smile, which is kind of cute, but not what we want. Um, so yeah, this one is going in the trash. This is not a good prototype. Then I reprinted it with a raft. So this is just an additional stabilization piece. So instead of just relying on a few perimeters to stabilize it, it just prints this big chunky thing, which you can then take apart. So that's what I'm gonna try now. Let me get a fresh file on the camera. Oh yeah, Sodium has a realization in chat. Uh, they're saying, it looks like as soon as the printed bolts hit the floor, Tuco decides he's not interested. He gets about two steps into chasing. <laughs> yeah, it does seem to have something to do with the weight or the sound or otherwise how, just how they bounce around. So certainly I'm, I'm gonna see if I can try printing some with a denser material and denser infill. Well, not something that he could, like I wouldn't use like 
the metal loaded filament because I think he might just hurt himself on that. Probably would be, that, be bad for his teeth, but maybe just printing it with either wood composite or just regular PLA with much higher density. Hey Tuco, you are sitting right there. That's really cute. Servo AF right now. I don't think I can quite look up there to keep myself in focus. If I ever do wear like a like a heads up display or something in my glasses, it would be for the camera so that I know when it's in focus. sturdy enough, actually. I think that's probably thanks to the material it's made in. I don't think this printed in PLA would quite be what I want. So this is printed in tea. The brand of the filament is Tallman Tea Glass. Um, but it's, it's basically just a really nice quality pet plastic, like, like what water bottles are made out of. So it tends to be pretty resilient. So this piece doesn't necessarily need to be super strong, I thought, because it's just mostly holding the wires, but, but then it turns out that because of its geometry, it actually does not have that much room for support. So using the same strong material is probably not actually that bad. But the main reason I picked it was for consistency, so that it would look the same as the other brackets. Man, this is really such a versatile tool. test fit it before tidying that up too much more. Yeah, a little cat loaf. Oh man, pardon me, I need to blow my nose again. Oh, I'm pretty happy with how that looks at least. So I think that wants to be these wires want to come down pretty much straight, but then they want to be kind of kinked so that they can take a bit of extra slack up. Like that, maybe. Do you need to take out those lower screws before I go any further? Um, where is that wrench? Is it behind my cat? Me too, go. Um, where is the hex wrench? The game that I'm always playing. Whoa, hot glue gun. Ah. I'm hoping this fits, but I'm not going to be really surprised if there's some area where it doesn't but then it would be really nice if it's something that I can fix without having to reprint it. But if I have to reprint it, it's only like a 45 minute print. So there's really not a lot 
that can go wrong at this point. Kind of nice to have a way to bundle these little wires together, perhaps. But Actually, putting those under the coax might be nice. LiDAR also becomes a side channel antenna for this, uh, this Magnesian chip. Uh, that's, I think, roughly the wire routing I want. This is going to need to move further this way to clear that stabilization plastic, I think. But that's going to avoid crossing wires through the heat sink, which is what I was earlier having trouble with. Oh, I think I might still need to cut out for the coax. I think the coax is the only thing this is still stuck on. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell if everything else is clear with the coax still stuck like that. Tantalum is really close, but I think it'll clear. Oh, can I get that on camera? So the little yellow tantalum capacitor has very little room. This whole assembly is a little bit further this way than it will actually be seated because these wires need a little bit of pressure and the screws will actually want to sit this a little bit further down and a little bit further to the right than it is right now, but right now the coax is... Oh, the coax and the... No, maybe just down. I was thinking maybe the heat sink was in slightly the wrong place, but I think it's fine. I think I just need to cut out for the coax. Let me see if I can mock that up since... Like, I think I, I want to actually re, like, update this in the 3D model, but let me see if I can just quickly cut something out just for test fitting to see if there are any other problems that I can also solve at the same time. So, that. I just want to cut from approximately the left side of that opening there to where that little plastic nubbin happens to be. And then cut out maybe, what is that, like 20 millimeters? That's gonna be pretty deep. do this without splitting the plastic. Let's see how strong this pet pl or this pet plus uh, Tolman stuff is. Or this isn't pet plus, and that's another plastic I used. This is this is Tolman tea glaze. A different kind of pet. Oh, that was a big split. Hmm. Okay. That might be basically what I end up needing though. Oh, that's super long. Because if that's what I need, then this will need to be more supported. Or I'll need to find some other way around that, because that's just not going to be strong. Let's 
So it looks like I can put that flush against the circuit board on the right side. This side actually looks great, if that will ever focus. It's focusing on the wrong thing. Yeah, okay, so the right side looks great. This is flush against the circuit board, gives me a nice kind of intentional opening for that connector, hides all this junk, gives me some stabilization. Then we've got some problems. So the heatsink, definitely closer to the edge than I thought it was, which would mean that this already thin piece needs to be even thinner, which is not so good. And we needed some kind of cutout for this. It looks like it didn't have to be that far down. It looks like it could have ended right about where my fingernail is and it would have been fine. And then this whole heatsink thing just needs to be moved about. It looks like a half a millimeter closer to the edge, which might just mean that this piece can't exist anymore. And that then this is then supported mostly through this path, which is a little bad, but I could try to add a support rib right along this edge that might help with that. This is really close. And if I push this side down, um, that actually fits all right if you don't include how it's pushing the, this, like the heat sink is interfering here, but before it hits the heat sink, like this clearance is actually great and the wire entry looks fine. So like when I hold that part into place, the rest of it looks good. Cool. So that should be a really quick set of modifications and then we can just reprint this piece. But I think I like that look a lot. It's pretty consistent. You know, it looks like this is a... I like the exposed heat sink a little bit too. It's like, you know, looks like it is as power hungry as it is. Hey cat, you're sitting on my mouse. I wonder if I can work around that. You're licking me. You're such a good little licker. I hope I don't make you sick, little cat. Hmm. Cat break. Oh, Tuco has managed to open the settings for the space mouse. I guess that's what one of the buttons I never do actually does. Oh, Andy in chat is asking if, uh, with pet plastic like this, if I can flame polish it. That's an interesting question. I've never tried that, but it seems like you'd probably have to be really careful with it to not let it heat up enough to discolor if you wanted to avoid that. But yeah, it seems like that might be worth a try. I don't have any idea if that would work. I've certainly got enough printer scrap from that material that I could try it without having to waste any fresh material. Cat butt. <laughs> oh, Tuco. Let's see if I can use this computer without having to move him. This was our earlier 3D print. Yeah, this, it was about an hour, I guess. This estimate seems to be about right, usually. So yeah, you can see why the raft helped. Like there was very little contact area because these little posts are the only part of it that's actually touching the circuit board. Everything else is kind of hovering above it a little bit. And we have that. Oh, this is gonna be hard to go. Can I move that mouse a few inches to the left, little dude? Can you do that? Is that gonna work? Can we share? Oh yeah, we can share this. I think. Oh, I added a hotkey for the CAD. There we go. That feels better. Oh, interesting question from chat. 
Let me see if I can parse this. So Sofa King in chat asks, would it make sense to combine the LiDAR backplate and the camera? Do you mean the cover we're just designing here or the camera housing itself? I don't think so in either case. Like, I don't want to replace the camera housing with plastic because that's actually a pretty important optical piece and I want to keep it really rigid. And as for combining this and either of the other two brackets, it's helpful to be able to take them apart separately. So I don't know if I'm not quite understanding your question, but if I, if I understand the question, my answer is I like having these separate. Um, and for this cover, this is actually pretty structural. Like, like this piece is actually what the LiDAR is anchored to. Um, I kind of reversed the function of the two original plastic pieces. So normally this front piece is, um, well, I guess I didn't. There, like normally the back piece has mounting ears. And so I basically replaced the mounting ears with this other side attachment that lets me anchor it to the camera. That's what I've got so far. This should be this should be much better than what I currently have. So okay, I need the cutout for the for the coax, and I need to move the uh, move the heatsink. Let's look at the heatsink first. I think that's going to be maybe a minor upheaval in the design. set by this. No, that's way too much. That's going to cause problems on the other side. Um, I mean, this is small. I'm gonna say like, just make this six instead of 6.8 and that might be what we want. But then I definitely wanna reinforce all this other stuff because that's gonna be really weak otherwise. And then let's make room for the coax over here while we're in this sketch. I think what I wanna measure is from the center of the coax connector to like the screw hole center or something else I can conveniently measure. So basically I want this to be a rectangle with the construction line down the middle. I want this to be on this line. And then the distance between this point and this line is what I'm going to try to measure. This isn't going to be amazingly accurate, but I'm also going to try to make this not have to be super tight. Let me compare that to where that cutout is on here. Yeah, that seems about right. So then, as for width, this only needs to be fairly small make it a little bit wider just so that it doesn't have to be super accurate uh, either in terms of like the print or in terms of the angle of this connector I think 4.8 millimeters there would be pretty generous actually and then 
depth, I'm going by basically how far down on the cable do I have to go before I to go. You found my space mouse. Can I let you use the armrest as a headrest and then I keep the mouse free from me? Does that work, Duke? So I want, like, how far down does this have to go before it would actually clear the edge of this case? Ten millimeters. Ten millimeters. So that's the cutout I want. And then I'll want to round some of these edges too, but that can come later. So actually maybe I can just add that to this extrusion. Where was that? Maybe that extrusion is lost forever. Usually I can click on the feature and find it, but this time it's just showing me the fillet. Was that it? No, that was the other direction. Well, let's just roll back until we find it. Understand why that was disappearing and then coming back. Let's reselect these, maybe. Okay, I think that's what I wanted. Let's uh, change this one too, if we can. I think I want something like that. I kind of want this one to be bigger though. Maybe I should just be doing that as a separate fillet. Let's delete this fillet and just try that again as a couple of different operations. Oh, this is already a separate operation. That might have been part of the problem. Okay. Well, let's do this one first because this one's going to be special. So maybe it wants to be the same diameter as these. Yeah. Oh, cat, you sure are laying on everything. Oh, you're so good at that. Oh, 
first map and I just want that one to be pretty rounded for the wire's sake. Okay, so there's that. Um, next, I think, is reinforcing particularly this area. What is right next to there? There's a good bit of clearance right there. So actually making this a little bigger might be nice. Um, this fillet is going to get in the way, I think. Yeah, let's take out this fillet. And what did that break? That broke that little tiny piece of the sketch. Excuse me. Okay. I think that will repair my sketch. <laughs> I just want to make this piece thicker specifically. Yeah, that makes me happier. And maybe like a little ridge around the other side of this too. I have a lot of room right outside of this. Like, I could reinforce the whole outside of this hole and that would actually help a lot. Um, yeah, so maybe I just wanna do that kind of the same way I did this. Yeah, let me call this reinforcement and let's try to add some more stuff to this sketch. So that's where I drew this box of stuff. Then I also want something specifically around all of this geometry. So let's use those as a reference point. Let's try to avoid using the curvy bits as a reference point because I keep messing those up when I go back and delete the curves. Um, do want to take the advantage of the offset tool, I think, to make this easier. Can I get away with two millimeters there? I mean, probably not. Certainly not on the side with the, um, with the coax. But I'll just delete from that side and actually make a pretty thick support on the other sides where I can afford to have it. Let's just have that as a starting point, but the coax is going to want like all of this space. So 
So now it's leaving mostly these two areas, which I need to extend left some more. Actually, I want to extend them only to this outer boundary, which I guess we already have. So I'm being careful to constrain it to 90 degrees and to be coincident with the other points. So that should kind of connect them to the extent that I want. Oh, I need to do the same thing up here. At least I think I'm constraining them to be connected. I might have to double check that. I think, oh yeah, that one does not. Let's fix that. Do I need to project this? Hmm. Coincident. This point. Oh. How did that not work last time? Okay, well now I seem to have fixed my ability to create coincident constraints. Here, I think we want to extrude that and that to the surface and join it. That didn't work. Let's try that. Yay, that's what I wanted. Hmm. You know, I think maybe I do want this to extend all the way over at least that edge, and then I'm just going to fillet it to give it a rounded edge here, and not... Because, uh, yeah, I need a cutout, but this is more than I need. Um, let's just get rid of this line. see what I can do with that, actually. Oops. I want to edit the feature, not the profile sketch. That's the one. Uh, how much can I shave off of that? Yeah, that's more like what I wanted. Still plenty of support around there, but a lot of room for this cable. And I think I want that to be a chamfer instead of a fillet if I can get away with it. I don't know why chamfer doesn't have a hotkey. Yeah, I think I just want to chamfer that as much as I can. And then... Let's just clean up some of these really sharp edges, maybe. I guess maybe people do end up filleting more often, but... I don't know, man, it's the fillet conspiracy. Anything else that's going to interfere with? I mean, I think that's looking pretty good. I mean, that whole thing does not come down any deeper than the perimeter there, which is already pretty well spaced against off, or spaced off the board, so it won't hit any of the integrated circuits. Let's, uh, let's get that ready for another print. So for anyone who's just joining us, this is a cover for 
the back of this modified camera plus LiDAR plus gimbal assembly. And it's not the most important piece we've modeled, but its job is mostly to make it look nice and keep the wiring in place. And the latter is actually pretty important because otherwise the wiring will interfere with the gimbal operation. So far I've been solving that problem with a piece of tape, but this should improve things a good bit. And I have a prototype which had a couple of problems and now we're making another revision. The biggest changes here, I moved the heat sink a little bit closer to the edge. I made an opening here for the coax cable and um, added some more internal reinforcement here around the edge here and around this edge. I'm wondering now if I can actually smooth, well, I don't actually want to smooth these edges. These edges are going to butt up against a piece of metal, so having them be sharp like this is actually probably exactly what I want. So yeah, let's try printing this. Oops, I want to save it first. I guess I already saved it. Wire cover two. So this is using mostly the default settings for T-Glass in the Type-A Cura, but I did have to go in and fix the, uh, I think there was just a typo in the support distance, so it wasn't going to give me nearly enough support material. And I think, I think this is about what they wanted, and it seems to be printing all right so far. This is using a raft and plenty of support material. Let's go through it layer by layer once it loads. So yeah, this is the raft. You can see a little cutout in the raft for like around the heat sink where it doesn't end up needing that support, but. So then we've got the pillars that it ends up sitting on the circuit board with. Then we already start supporting that really thin region over there. That's looking pretty printable to me. Let's uh, get that loaded in the printer. I think I still need to clean the print bed, so. Oh, actually, I could save from cleaning the print bed by moving this around, which would also level the wear on my printer a little bit. So maybe let's stick that over there and then, uh, then re-upload that. With the PEI print bed coating I'm using, it sticks pretty well without having to reapply glue, but you do have to clean off the surface with isopropyl alcohol pretty much after every print for it to work. But you can cheat a little bit by moving the print around on the print bed so you're using a fresh portion. Now oh, there's the little robot robot in the way for us. All right, so that'll print. Um, I think the next thing to do is to do the hot glue application while we're while we've got the camera ready here. I've got the wires in place pretty much where I want them. So there are some places where it wouldn't be bad if I got hot glue on the wires, but I'm mostly trying to avoid getting hot glue on the wires and just using it to block the light around the edges of the circuit board. This hot glue gun is nice and warm. So let's try this. Basically I want to do something like... That is not really coming out quite yet. 
Dear girl, I really don't want to burn you. That's maybe a little more than I actually want, but... Let me try to... Oh, Tuco. Jeez. Tuco, maybe I should move you. This is not a... Good place for you, honey. Hey, <laughs> dude. I'm glad that didn't burn you, but now it's stuck in your fur. Hey, <laughs> boy. Oh, I know, I know. I'm sorry. Hey. Hey, little cat. Hey, dude. Can I use a little isopropyl to get that off you? Burn my finger trying to get it off of her. You're not gonna like this. Shh. 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 Hey, Tuco, part of that is still hot. You need to be careful. At least I got you to move. Ah, okay. No more burning my cat. I'm sure I'll burn myself some more, but I don't think I burned him. I just got hot glue in his fur, which is also bad. Okay, also I burned myself and that hurt. <laughs> Let me wash this off slightly in cold water. So if I do end up with a little more hot glue in here than I want, I think I can mostly trim it with an X-Acto knife. Um, I also might be able to hit it with a heat gun to get it to melt and then seep flatter down into the thing, but then that make make it harder, harder to remove later. I also don't want to damage any of the wiring. All right, let's make sure we can get a good steady stream of thin glue out of this before I put it anywhere near the circuit board. This is going to be pretty effective at light blocking though, because it's like, it's just so opaque. Ah, and so dribbly. This is not my best hot glue gun, but I don't always want to use the really heavily pigmented stuff in there because then it's hard to clean out. Also, I thought this one might be easier to use for this project because of the really small tip, but maybe not. I think I want some tweezers to hold the wires out of the way for this next part. Actually, I should unplug that coax so that I don't cover it with hot glue.
taking it out a little bit so I get more room. So we've got these edges that I want to light block. I'm definitely going to have to clean out around the screw hole a little bit, um, but I needed to get the area right next to the screw hole. Um, and then there's just these big holes in the circuit board that I want to want to fill too. Glue gun might also just be getting a little too hot. I don't know. trying to fill in the holes, fill in the gaps. I still need to fill in this side next to the nuts, which is going to be a little harder. a couple places where I needed to get the hot glue in a particular area and I'll have to clean it up some of the overspread but right around the coax all right yeah well that I think concludes the making a mess phase of this part connector if I can swing it. That would actually finish the perimeter of this. Alright. That's as close to light tight as I think I'm getting it at this point. I mean, having these nuts glued in is not a bad thing, actually. I might as well put a little bit more right here. Oops, that was a goober that I wasn't expecting. I'm gonna have to take that off. Okay, I think I can let some of this cool and then clean it up. <laughs> oh, are we having streaming problems? Sorry, I didn't notice that. Oh, weird. Was that a YouTube problem? It looks like the video disappeared, um, but not the audio. That's pretty weird. I think the little stream health thing was off the screen, but... Oh yeah, it's interesting. Now it's saying video output low. That is weird. All right, are we back? Trying to be back. Working on being back. I restarted OBS here to see if that helps. I don't know whether that was a real problem. It looks like maybe um, So yeah, it looks like folks were saying the audio was cutting in and out and then <laughs> Well, yeah, so if the stream went offline on purpose because I shut down OBS and then OBS was taking a long time to restart So I, I like waited on it for a second and had to kill it. So that's why it took a little longer to restart than usual. So I don't know what was going on there. I did notice 
YouTube was telling me my video output was low, so that might have been an OBS issue or a network congestion issue. I'm not quite sure, but sorry about that. I think we're back now. Hmm. One person in chat's reporting that latency is down to 10 seconds from 50 seconds. Okay, that's cool. I was misreading that at first, saying latency is down from 10 seconds to 50 seconds, thinking, wait, that's not an improvement. But that's good. Oh, this hot glue is very sticky. Let's see if I can actually release it. unstick the glue that I want to keep while I'm doing this. Oh good, I was afraid it was going to either melt or leave a stain on the plastic and it looks like it didn't do either. It wasn't super high temperature when it was applied, so I think we're all right. And then I think we should be in a similar position with this goober, like it was relatively cold. use ice purple for that, but I don't want to get it all over everything. Maybe just a tiny drop. Yeah. Tiny drop of ice purple right there. Is that going to help? Most of this, I think I want to just go over some of the other outliers with a knife and then just not worry about the rest of it too much unless there's a problem with fit. than I needed right here. Like anything that's going to like stick out beyond the plastic cover should probably go. It leaves then that kind of a matte finish when you cut it with a knife like that. having a shop cat. He does seem to know which objects I'm using and he likes hanging out on those. I mean sometimes it's just oh that's a warm comfortable object but often it's the you know like the combination of he wants to be near me and he wants to be on something warm so he'll just pick the thing that's near me that's warm which is usually the thing that I'm using. Okay, I'm 
almost done with this stage of it. It feels pretty well pruned. I have hot glue goobering over everything. Maybe let's test fit it with this one. Oh yeah, actually I still need to clean out right around where this mounts, because that's not clean at all. So let's do that. Trying to do this carefully without putting stress on the gimbal. of things you shouldn't use an exacto knife to do. Skewering hot glue, prying hot glue. Yeah, kind of like that, getting that hole cleaned out. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I was really annoyed that when I ha would have to restart the stream, like, oh no, I'm gonna have like multiple streams and it's gonna be hard, but I mean, for the stuff that I'm editing, I've just got a huge pile of videos anyway, so it doesn't really make, make a difference. YouTube, it automatically combines them. And so then that just leaves Vimeo. So when I upload our archives to Vimeo for Thinreal Labs, I need one file, but I can combine them without re-encoding with FFmpeg, and that works out pretty well. quite keeping the light tightness in the corners. I think it might, I think this might end up being roughly equivalent to if I had just not even tried to put any hot glue in the corners. So, oh well. And if you're wondering why I don't use the isopropyl for here, it's hard to contain that technique for something where there's a continuous run of glue because it'll just want to seep under all the hot glue that you that you have in the area. So I find it harder to use the hot glue removal technique for small adjustments. There we go. Oh, this might actually have turned out better on this side. Looks like I've got a little bit of light blocking going on. Maybe that's just because it's dark in there. What I really want is a hot glue gun with like a tiny, tiny needle nozzle on it, but I don't think I care that much to try to make something like that right now. So I'm just gonna do another quick test fit on here to see if I have the hot glue out of all the areas this thing is going to care about. And so the heat sink isn't going to fit anyway because the part's not quite right, but I'm looking for fit here. That seems nice. Good for fit 
there, and that seems nice. I think that's going to be all right. And the hot glue actually kind of provides a little bit of nice cushioning in some of the areas. It doesn't seem to be deflecting it. I think that's going to be good once the printer finishes. So it's still pretty early in this print. So, great. Well, I think this means it's time to put away the hot glue gun and then do some more CAD. <laughs> I keep printing these little, like, I don't know, they're like little snowmen or something. Printing, <laughs> not printing, but using the hot glue gun manually dribbling them out. See, that's how we make 3D printing appealable. It would have been 3D dribbling, but we wanted it to sound more accurate, so we called it printing. Sometimes when I'm looking at the at the monitor that the camera's connected to instead of at what I'm doing, I feel like I'm one of those like you know one of those people they show on infomercials doing something kind of comically badly just to prove that you don't actually need to have you know motor skills at 100% in order to use a product. Which is sort of a weird thing to do, but I don't know. It's like one of those moments that makes me feel like like that person that's having a seemingly way too hard time doing something really easy is when I'm you know, trying to operate through the, through the camera viewfinder's physical displacement and time lag. to work on that capstan. So that's what we got now. Okay, so this is, this is kind of what we wanted. Slow performance. That's weird. Anyway, um, yeah, so I think I'm so I'm gonna mostly ignore the load cell right now and just start with this and try to build the capstan that goes on the end of the shaft. 
oh, I guess, I guess one thing that we had gotten to the point of kind of deciding but not really modeling last time was the screw choice and placement. Let's go ahead and put those in and make sure the capstan can avoid the screw heads. So I think this was M3 by eight that I had chosen. Let's grab one from the McMaster library and then just check it against what we have. Oops. Basically this in black oxide. All right, so something like that. And let's start out by just moving this to be fully engaged with the screw and then give it a measured amount of clearance. So these the slightly wider hole or slightly higher diameter holes holes here are 30 millimeters. These are 28 millimeters. I'm gonna go with these. Have a little bit more room. And then I'm just gonna figure out how far I want these to stick out to have a good amount of strength. I'm gonna run these. So these holes are not that deep. So I'm gonna run these all the way into the hole and then back it off by kind of a safe amount. And so, calipers. Four millimeters. So that's just how much I wanna move this entire thing up. I can just make a few more of those. So components, capture position, I want this component, and I want to move it from point to point using these circles as reference. Let's do that again. It's our mounting arrangement, I think. These are a little closer together, these are a little farther apart. And for making our capstan, I think we just want a sketch on the top plane here. Let's give this a name. What do you want, cat? Uh, 
Oh, hello from uh, from Skila and Chat. They're the one who had been working on some uh, kind of Twitch client related stuff for the bot recently. Welcome back. Still deep in mechanical land in the robot. This time working on the capstan that measures the uh, the travel of the cord. Oh, Tuco, you found a good spot. Make maybe a line on this side that shows what we have to avoid. Um, well, I don't know. I guess first let's just make the profile and then we can move it into place. Um, so I think we decided that the paracord needs about six millimeters to lay flat. Yeah, so if we want just space for two layers of... Hey, Tuco, are we working on all the keyboards today? Oh. <laughs> Orbiting the camera, Tuco, as is your usual behavior. Let's make this 12 millimeters. That's kind of the width of our base that we need for, for you know, cables. We'll also need, also need sides to keep it on. We might want this to be rounded. Mm. Let's also make this horizontal. That can go somewhere around here. Let's project some things. We know we want this shaft projected. Actually, not all of those. Well, I guess we have all of those now. Anyway, that's fine. Take that, and that, and this. <laughs> and maybe these screw tops. Group these screws together. Oh, maybe I want this to be a new component. Can you not nest components? Oh, you can have child components. I don't think that's what I wanted. Anyway. I just want an easy way to turn these all on and off separately. Or, you know, together, not separately. construction geometry. I don't even want that. Nor do I want that. All right, so this is what I need, I'm trying to hold. So, I mean, I don't, 
really quite know how to figure out what the best diameter for this to be is. I've been assuming it can be fairly small, but you know, I just don't want it to be super extreme because then that's probably wearing out the cord by having it bend too much. Hey Tuco, you wanna go outside, honey? Tuco's gonna go say hi to the neighbors. Alright. So, I don't know, maybe I just set a diameter somewhere. So, first of all, I want a center line for all this. This is the radius of the capstan. Um, what does it look like if I make this a centimeter? That seems fine. So yeah, it seems like maybe I shouldn't make the edges super stiff because that might or really straight up and down because that might introduce kind of more friction than is necessary. But I also kind of want to keep the bottom pretty flat just so that they can the two layers can sit next to each other nicely. So I think first what I want to do is figure out how much clearance I want to give myself from all of this stuff. So like this and these especially, and this, is this a thing? I guess the offset wants me to select these separately anyway. shape get that complicated. Um, I mean, I guess part of this is I'm thinking about whether it's worth trying to, again, move this to be more in line with the bearing. Because ideally, the location where the force is really kind of pulling toward the ceiling here, which is going to be pretty much halfway in between one of the two loops, so right about here, Ideally, that should be way back here on the bearing. But then that means making this wider so that I can sit it farther back, and then I have to do something else to get the, get the mechanical connection to these screws, which seems like a huge problem. Yeah. See what it looks like if we just give ourselves like a millimeter from this. Mostly I just want this to be enough clearance so that any amount of wobble that we end up developing in this capstan ends up not causing it to scrape against these screws. Let's be kind of conservative here, and let's say maybe one and a half millimeters. So now this is... Is 
is kind of the limit of what we want to leave room for in the vicinity of the encoder. This needs to be slightly different. I just want a really long, arbitrarily long vertical line, which is collinear with this one. And then I can use that as a reference for this other stuff. So then this, I want a couple of angled pieces. Make sure that those are both coming down to the same place. So we want this to have a center line. Cool. And I've got that. And then this is describing like the inner surface where the the cord sits. I also want an offset from this to provide the actual like structural shape of the capstan. Let's see if I can do that with the offset tool. So this won't be the entire structure, but this will be like the minimum structure. Let's say two millimeters. want this to be on this guideline now. So that's like the minimum kind of shape that I need for the capstan. So then I need to mirror this on the other side. I want to fill in most of this in the middle. And then I need a set screw that will hold this on. A set screw is the other reason for kind of a, not making the minimum diameter too small because the easiest way to do a set screw is to just use a little, a little M3 screw and a embedded nut. And that technique just gets hard as you want to make this really tiny. Um, so I'm pretty soon going to revolve this, but I'm looking to see if there's something else I should add in here before revolving it. I think that's mostly the support for this. So the, as far as the, the interface between like the bearing here and the capstan, I actually want this to touch the the kind of inner portion of the bearing here just a little bit in order to seat against it firmly. Or at least, you know, have the option of that. So I think that's what shapes shapes this side of of my uh, like the kind of inner portion. So I think I want that to actually sit kind of right around here. Let's make more construction lines. Oh no. Oh, Wild Mania in chat is saying that they need to go take their cat to the vet or and they, their cat gave, gave birth like yesterday, a couple days ago. Um, 
Yeah, yesterday gave birth to six kittens, and now they're sick. And yeah, I hope they're fine. Oh. Little critters. Life is so. You know, it's hard to, hard to actually like anything because things are temporary. That's a good cat, though. Hey, boy. The camera's way over there, but you're over here with me. Ah. You know? Ah. Whoa. The bolts are all over the place now. I can take this off you and close the door if you're hanging out inside too. <laughs> or you just want to play with this. Okay. Dropping it way over there. Hmm. Oh, you little monster. I saw, I saw part of the video of, of um, Wild Mania, their cat giving birth, and it was really, it's always something really special. She seems satisfied and really tired afterwards. So yeah, I hope she's okay. Hey, little boy. I wonder what it was like when Tuco was a baby. I don't really know much about what his early life was like. I adopted him when he was I think a year and a half, maybe two years. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Man, with all this sneezing, I might not have a really long stream up uh, in me today, but uh, so far I'm still pretty into this. Let's make this small, like a, a millimeter. I wanted to mention that too. This is just enough space to keep it away from the bearing. This will definitely be much better once we actually have this camera working. I should try not to get too bogged in down to the design because it will be really nice to have it going.
So also thinking about printability, I would like to make pro probably this side flat to make it easier to print. Offset history there. Okay, well, maybe that's something to start with. And I can add the features I need for. Hmm. What is that all about? I guess I need to set this thickness separately. That's two, that's two. Whoa. That needs to be parallel. No, it doesn't. This needs to be. Oh, I guess that's what I want. Yes, there's a lot of these angles I haven't really decided about yet. Whoa. <laughs> That's very under constrained. So, let's set a distant or length for this. I'm going to say like Seven millimeters. And can we set an angle? Like that. Let's just set this maybe. I think that might be a good starting point. Oh, a good context question from uh, from CLF, <laughs> who also says here, a bird just flew into my window, has waddled under my car, and I think best not to bother it more by trying to get it out. Yeah, that's a tricky problem. I had a, apparently a pigeon fly into my place while I was out on a business trip one day and a friend was house sitting and he had a really hard time getting it out and he was also worried about trying to avoid having Tuco eat it. And then um, they're also asking, is this uh, capstan going on an optical encoder? And yes, that's exactly what it's going on. So the, the idea is this is going to be kind of the final thing that the cord goes through before going all the way up to the ceiling. And this will be used for measuring the cord's travel with the encoder. It'll also be used for measuring the force on the cord, which will be used for various things. Like I think it'll be useful for detecting fault conditions, like it's stuck on something. I think it might also be useful for balancing the amount of uh, tension on the wires when we're kind of zeroing the robot. So there might be some good uses for that. but. Yeah, this, this capstan is for measurement rather than for drive. Oh, and US Water Rockets has a good question. Is there going to be any sort of Ninja Flex tread in the pulleys for grip? Well, I don't know if I can do that without making the whole thing out of Ninja Flex, which I don't think would help with my accurate measurements goal. Um, this is probably going to be pretty grippy even without any additional stuff, but one thing I might do after I do the revolve here is to add a bunch of little tiny ribs in the 
in the capstan, and that might be a good idea. I might, I might do that after I revolve it. That's a good suggestion. <laughs> or a good, um, the tread is, is a good suggestion. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but yeah. And then so this side is flat to give me a place to print it. This side is angled because it can be, I guess, and to kind of dodge the, um, the bolt heads as much as I can right there. And actually, since I can dodge the bolt head so much, um, well, I guess that's the bolt head. I'm not really dodging them that much. So, yeah. I think it might just be time to revolve this. Oh, this can't be a... That can't be a construction line, can it? Is the filled shape. So that's the kind of rough shape we have. So yeah, actually maybe adding the tread next is a good thing to do before hollowing out anything here. It's a good idea. Let's try adding that on, how about we just do that on an axis like this one? Oh, actually, scratch that. Let's do that on this flat side. Then we can just extrude it downward until we hit this surface. Oh, this might be a good use for the ribs tool, perhaps. So I want to start with this. Oh, maybe not. I think I think this will just be a straight up extrusion. So I think we want to start with that and then just have little circles that we place along here and then replicate the circles. Giving me a snap point at the corner. I can't even quite tell. I don't think it is. Let's make a line to at least use as a reference there. Uh, circle right there. Um. Sure, a millimeter diameter, seems about right. And there's a way to repeat these, right? Circular pattern, one object, that center point. How many of these? Suppress. Huh. Oh, I think that's for the original one. like 20. Something like that maybe. That's maybe even too many. Mostly just want a couple on each side. Maybe a little bit larger and 12 of them. Oh no, US Water Rockets in chat is trying to tempt me to knurl this. I don't know if I want to do knurling for this. I think I'd rather do knurling where it's actually going to matter. Okay, another 1.5 millimeters. That might work. Let's try that. I select all of these. Mm, the 
doesn't seem to like joining that. Oh, maybe I just need to select something that doesn't have a hole in it. That surface. Yeah. Yeah, that's maybe more like it. That's pretty bumpy. While we're doing weird things to the surface, can I actually maybe step back and smooth out these? Not too much, but something about like that. Yeah, that's more like what I want. Let's just do some fillity, fillitiness on some of these that could use it. <laughs> it's a little extreme. Point eight millimeters, I think, is where it's at there. So this is going to be like right up against the bearing, so I don't really want to do anything to that surface. And then this still needs a hole, and then we need to find a place for a set screw where it won't really get in the way. So for that, here's our encoder again. How it sits on there. It's kind of cute. Seems pretty grippy. That load cell is not really in the right place yet, but it's just a rough position. Alright, so. I think I just want to start cutting holes for that. It's going to be a little annoying just how there isn't really room to see in between these parts. Do we have cat? Of where he was, so maybe he's in the hallway again. So I'll sketch on here. Um, let's call this sh something. Oh, grips. And shaft. So for this, so while we're in this sketch, I can turn off this body and then turn this back on and then project that. I also want to know about this dimension, but not quite yet. Anyway, let's project this whole circle too. So we'll be sitting on the part of this that isn't fully flatted. So we'll want the very first cutout to be a full circle. Um, I also want to make sure that we don't fit too tightly on this. Like I don't want to have the same problem I was having before with the really tight D shaft on the, on the spool where the tightness of the plastic was causing it to bind and wobble. I want the I want the pinch points to really just be the back of this D-shaft and the screw against this flat surface. So... Ah. All right, 
right, so first let's get this. Both of these, I guess, extruded to that depth. I was just cutting the short one, but how did I get both? I think the extrude is slightly magical in this program. I think I need to understand at some point how this face chaining stuff works, because that looks like what's going on here. Interesting. Well, okay, well that is exactly what I wanted, even though I don't quite understand how it happened. I think if we turn the encoder back on and do a section view, maybe we should start to see this. Why is it all the same color? Normally you can see boundaries between materials here, but that's kind of what we're looking at. So that leaves room for the set screw to go in kind of over here between a couple of these ribs. Pretty nice. I kind of want to make it a little bigger though, is the thing. Can I do that on here? Yeah, 0.15 millimeters, maybe 0.2. So then the, I guess the other thing is I kind of want this bottom surface to still be accurate. Oh, good question from uh, Isan in chat who asks, so what do you think about self space as a CAD tool? So I don't know enough about it, actually. I've been really excited to learn more, and so I, I need to make sure that I have a project soon where I just do most of the work in solve space to learn more about it. But um, yeah, no, it looks really cool, and I've been wanting to learn more. And actually, this, uh, this motor here is something that uh, Sodium, who's often in chat, uh, contributed, and I think they made this in, in solve space. So yeah, no, it looks like a pretty neat tool. I just... Um, haven't spent a whole lot of time with it yet. You know, Fusion 360 is certainly not my favorite tool, but it's one that I'd been wanting to learn more, especially since a lot of maker folks have been using it since you, you can download it for free, you know, well, download it. You can run it on their computers for free. Um, and it's a pretty powerful tool, especially for manufacturing. Set, but a circle, which would be, oh, let's make a point. Let's take the midpoint of that, go to the circle. Now we have a construction line that specifies the bottom of the circle. Let's glue that to the intersection point there. So now we have this circle. And we want the center point to be on the center line. 
now we have this circle that is a little bit bigger than the other circle, but anchored at the bottom like we want it to be. And then I want the distance between these two points. That'll be our extra tolerance there, so that'll be like a quarter millimeter. Is that even too big? That might even be too much. I think actually I don't want that to be the measurement. I think I want this to be the measurement. Okay. Okay, so that's the bottom, leaving extra room around here. Then I can also leave some similar extra room here since the top constraint will be from the set screw. So, can I offset this? I don't think that's what I want actually. Make these two lines equal. <laughs> sometimes it seems like I can get all the constraints I want in just a couple of mouse clicks, and then sometimes it seems like I'm making all of my constraints and lines and everything from scratch. I can turn the projected geometry all into into construction. So I think I'm left with a little bit of a weird set of profiles here, but I think that's what I want. So then I don't know what that's going to mean here. That's not what I want for sure. So here. Okay, I don't know if I can use edge chaining now that I'm making this shape so much more complicated. So let's start out with just this. Um, I think I want to leave a little bit of extra room though. So that was three millimeters. I'm just going to enter you know, 3.45 millimeters perhaps. extrusion. That is 13 millimeters, so maybe I'll do something similar and make that like 13 and a half manually for some extra clearance. Let's do 14 millimeters, like that's, might as well make that a little longer because that doesn't hurt. Okay, now I think if we put the encoder in there and do a section view, we'll actually see some clearance in places. section view. There we go. Yeah, that's looking better. So then that pretty much disappears at the bottom here. I think a section view along the other axis would be better.
Yeah, that's what I was going for. So it's like nice and snug at the bottom. Room for a set screw at the top. Yay. Okay, well that's looking nice. Let me save this, and then I think we might want to get some hardware in here for the, uh... Like, there are a lot of, lots of different ways to do set screws. I'm probably just going to try to do something using the parts I have handy here, which are mostly M3 screws and nuts. So, I'm gonna... Oh, this is actually probably what I need. Yeah, I'm gonna try just using the same ones that I'm that I've got in here for the shaft encoder hold in. Making a copy of this. Now I'm going to put the end of the screw. Oh, this is going to be way too big, isn't it? Um. Well, let's try this out. Something a little more like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see what I got in terms of smaller screws here. be a silly reason to make the whole diameter bigger. I mean, you can always make screws smaller. And also order smaller screws. I could use an M2. I don't have a lot of M2 nuts, but maybe here's one. M2 just seems like maybe not that big, or not that strong for this application. Oh, US Water Rockets is asking if there's even room for the nut. That's a good question. Um, just trying to get a feel for whether M2 would be absurdly tiny for this. I don't know, I mean, the main issue is in like how well it does it spreading out the force of this particular like point contact over into some plastic that can bear the force more easily. But like maybe an M2 by six would do it. I 
I mean, it would be nice to have a proper grub screw for this, probably. But yeah, this is this is what we got for M two by six. So these are the M three by eights that we're using for the encoder itself. That would fit kind of right against there with that screw embedded in the plastic. And it would rotate with the capstan. I think that would be all right. Oh, and then Sofa King is asking about, about screw inserts, I think. I do have M3 threaded inserts. Um, I guess I'm just not sure how I would get one of those in, since they're usually put in from what would be in this case, like the inside of the axle. So I don't know how I would get it up there effectively. Oh, that's interesting. US Water Rockets has another, another cool suggestion. Uh, they're saying it's not ideal, but you could come in diagonally from the flat end. So I think what that means is putting the screw in uh, from this side. I kind of like that actually, because that, I mean, yeah, it isn't ideal from like a set screw perspective. The screw wouldn't have as much holding force as it would otherwise, but it'd have a lot more ability to use a stronger screw and it wouldn't mess up the tread in here, which like any unevenness in here is going to affect my optical encoder, which is going to be bad. So I like that. Let's try that suggestion. Um, yeah, thank you. Always good to have fresh eyes on the problem and good suggestions. And it would almost be easier to do this whole thing with section analysis on. And then maybe we need a bigger screw. Yeah, maybe a bigger screw. You know, there is this little thing that if the screw sat up against there, that would actually be pretty sturdy. Oh. Yeah, something like that with a little bit longer screw, maybe. Um. Socket head might be doable even. I need to try the socket head M3 by 10 next. Yeah, let's just get rid of that screw and get another, get a socket head M3 by 10. better with that camera though. Yeah, I can see his tail out there. He's just standing guard in front of the shop. You know, I, I was a little worried about whether he would get along with folks when I ran workshops in this class, but he's been really happy with all the groups of people I've had in here. Oh, <laughs> US Water Rocket says, I'm forgetting how you're going to get a nut inside there. Maybe it's a bad suggestion. That's a good question. Um, nut inside there. Well, I can imagine a way that it could slide in there through the, the opening. Let me pick out some hardware and then, and then let's see how we could get it in there. So let's pick out an M3 by 10.
That's one thing. Let's also get a nut. Oh, and then Sodium is also suggesting if you're 3D printing it, could you do the embed the hardware mid print thing? Quite possibly. That would be nice. I haven't really done that before. There has always been some other way to do it. Plain old M3 here. Oh, I think I think US Water Rockets is thinking farther ahead than I am and, and they're they're already thinking that maybe embedding the nut mid print is gonna do it. That's cool. Alright, let's just put that kind of there for now. And let's try moving both of these. Can I do that? Oh, you know, if I angle this enough, maybe, which I probably should, since I don't want that angle to be too shallow. But, like, if I get this angle just right, maybe I can get the screw in through this surface and the nut in through, like, this surface. Show it digging in a little bit. Are you something like that? This is looking a bit sketchy. This might be one reason to make the diameter a little bit larger. Fourteen, maybe? That seems excessive. Let's try twelve. I think my little nubbins are stuck. <laughs> Failed constraint. So take that and make it on this. That makes it about the diameter of the encoder. Okay. I don't know why these are so ghosty. I mean, it gets an outline and I leave it alone for a while, which is kind of nice, but... Anyway, I think I just want to move these again. Have them be at less of a steep angle. I 
think that's roughly what I want. Oh, and Alfie is saying, instead of a nut, what about a proper threaded insert? Mostly because I would have to, like, for it to be strong enough, like, I couldn't put it in through the same side as the bolt, because then it would just, the bolt would just pull the threaded insert out. And to put it in the other side, it'd have to go through this whole shaft, which seems really annoying. So yeah, I think what I want is a, a slot to put the bolt in through this side, and then, wow, Fusion is getting a little crunchy right now. I'm used to saying that about the VM, but not the CAD software. Um, I think this is what I want. Let's try it. So for this, I want to make a sketch, I think, on the front face of this bolt. Chris Harris is asking, have you ever tried taping 3D prints? Do you mean, like, to hold them together or, like, so that I have a video recording? slightly heated threaded insert into undersized hole. Well, I mean, that will help get it in there, but that won't necessarily help it hold in in a strong way, especially with PLA. Um, oh, tapping 3D prints. Oh, that makes much more sense. Um, I have not tried that. I suspect that would depend a lot on what material you use. I don't know if I would expect PLA to hold threads, but maybe some other stronger materials. Um, anyway, I think, I think I'm going to try this. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Otter Duck. So, let's put a sketch on top of the ear. Oh, actually, I do want to capture position, but I also want to change my mind about that sketch. Actually, I want it to be on the bottom side of the screw here. <laughs> this is my world now, somehow. So let's project the screw cap and then make something a little bit bigger. Just a quarter millimeter. trying to take all the stuff I don't want to use for geometry and turn it into construction geometry. Okay, now I can extrude this the other side. a little bit weird, possibly broken, but there we go. That seems quite all right so far. And then I think we can use that same sketch to make a screw hole. Um, set screw base will be the name of that, sh that sketch. Oh, cool. US Water Rockets in chat says, uh, to answer Chris's question earlier, yes, I've tapped ABS to make pressure vessel adapters for soda bottles, and I put MPT threads on with a pipe tap. <laughs> the bottles explode before the adapters fail. That sounds pretty cool. Good to know. Yeah, I'll have to, I, I, I don't really have a setup right now for ABS, but 
there isn't really much I would need other than probably the filament. I have some ABS filament that's just the wrong diameter for my current printers, which is why I haven't been buying more. So let's turn that body off again. And I think here I want to make a clearance hole explicitly. Where am I? So three millimeters, 3.15 just to be on the safe side. Yeah, this is looking all right. Now we just need to make a slot for the nut. And I have this edge, I guess we can go ahead and fill it just for fun. And this is a little nasty, but I don't really care because it's interior and that's probably in the right shape for it to be. So nut, the nut is down here. And I think we already have some flat edges there. Yeah. So really, I wanna make a construction plane that's perpendicular to this one, I think. That works. What? Why is it projecting up there? That's not what I wanted. Am I in the wrong sketch? Okay, sketch, try that again. Sketch on this plane. Let's turn off the section. Project some stuff now. Okay, let's add a little bit of extra room. Um, I think I'm going to do something separate for the body of the nut itself, but just for the slot that leads up to that, I want that to have a decent amount of clearance so it's not annoying to get the nut in. Quarter millimeter, let's try that. Where's that nut? 
So neither of these. Well, I want that to go to the center line, I think. I just cut the nut in half also. That wasn't quite what I wanted. Yeah, let's only cut the only cut the container. Okay. And then the other half of that should kind of give the nut a place to kind of place to seat firmly. So for that, I think I want to sketch on top of the nut. <laughs> this little place right here. I guess if I just project all of these faces, I'll get the shape I want. And then a little bit of offset, just so we don't have really super tight fits here. That's not what I wanted. <sighs> it wants me to reselect all the curves. Why? Is this not like a real polygon or something? Make all of that construction geometry and then make something real around it. Ah, that's better. Let's try a minus Again, like quarter millimeter. So two sides. Oh, I can offset. So minus 0.25 on that side and plus 0.25 on this side, maybe. No. Oh, this is the wrong polarity. Maybe that's plus 0.25. Yeah, OK. I want to cut that out of this one. Yay, now I've uh, got a spot for that for that nut. Another fillet. Point seven five is probably fine. Okay, so nut slides in there, screw goes in there, encoder goes in there. Shaft looks like that. I guess this tiny edge here could stand. Oops. I just wanted a tiny chamfer. Tiny chamfer. Just to make it easier to get this in. Point two five, not twenty five. 
or 0.3 maybe, sure. That's a little much. 0.2, okay. Oh, are we having streaming problems here? <laughs> oh, US Water Rockets was saying that, it, that they think that the nut face projected is something more than a line earlier. Yeah, that seems about right. That's probably why I was having that problem. Um, I wonder what it's like if I fill out this just a little bit. I don't think this matters. in case that isn't quite a sharp edge. I don't want that jamming. So, okay. I think that's our capstan. And this is about ready to put in the print queue to get one to test. I guess we can rename this measurement capstan or something. Rename, yes. The measuring capstan, it will be called. Yeah, it is really satisfying making shapes like this. Alfie was saying, I'll never get tired of how satisfying parametric CAD can be. Yeah, I like it in general. It's, it's easy to get annoyed with particular tools, but then just to really enjoy the process itself. Are those threads? Oh, that's the nut, okay. Sorry, I was worried at first that my 3D print was going to be threaded, which would be weird. So that's the gap for the nut. That's what's actually kind of holding it. And then there's a through hole, basically. Hey, here you two go. Let's export this. Oh yeah, and we can switch materials for this too. I think this can probably just be plain PLA. Including this maybe? That might be a bit tough. I think I can do that though. Why is it offline? Oh, weird. Okay, so some folks in the chat are saying the stream has been going up and down. Yeah, I don't know what that is. So OBS is saying it's fine. YouTube on this end was saying it was having some trouble. Seems to be back now. Not quite sure what to do about this. Don't know if the problem's on my end. So that hole's nice and clear. A little bit of support. That's probably worth it to get a better print on these overhangs. Oh, hey, Tuco. Oh, are we off? Oh man, the stream is so annoyed right now. Um, Sodium is saying, it seems like the problem vanishes as soon as I look closely at it. Yeah, it seems like every time I see that this laptop says I'm offline, then it comes back. Weird. Um, maybe I should be changing the options to optimize for Less buffering, can I change that while we're on? I don't think I can change that while we're streaming, but maybe I'll change that between streams.
Yeah, right now I'm optimized for interaction instead of optimized for less buffering. I don't know if that matters. Back down. Oh, man. Well, it's the only thing I can do. Let me try restarting OBS. If I can ever hit the exit button. There it is. All right. Streaming is restarted, I hope. I think we're uh, on our way to being back. Okay, cool. Looks like it's coming back for some people already. So anyway, we've got what looks like a good print layout here. I'm gonna say analogy every capstan one dot code. Oh, yay, my print is done. So I'll go in there and change materials and get it started on this one. Yay, good timing. Okay, cool. Oh no. Sofa King in chat restart, uh, reports that the YouTube client crashed when I restarted the stream. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, well that print finished. This one is ready to go. So I will go over there and get this uh, swapped out and bring back the completed part. That file was called what now? Measurement capstan. It might be useful to make the 
moving parts in the winch bots, kind of a bright color like red, but then, uh, you know, use a more neutral color for the outside cover of the winch bot so it isn't quite so loud. So anyway, watch that start, but I've also got this piece that now that we can play with. Oh, I can hear the printer starting already. Purging the nozzle. All right, so here's the latest piece. Not focusing. Oh, US Water Rocket says the red knurled bolt in there looks like it's almost done. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, I had to get another, open another spool of red filament because I wanted to use the same kind, but it was almost done with that on the other side. Or on the other printer. And this is the tea glass plastic again. So we've got these nice big reinforcements around the heatsink hole, which I thought were necessary since I moved it to make it even thinner on this side, so I thought it would need that. Um, place for the coax up here. This feels pretty strong for such a tiny 3D printed part. It's nice. I'm not gonna try breaking it, but I'm gonna try not to break it and hope that that uh, shows that it's strong. Yeah, really just this needs to hold the wires down. And give it kind of a nice uniform look with the other brackets. Installing this. Here's the previous attempt, still mounted partially. So, I think I can put this coax back on now that I'm done with the hot glue. plugged in.
All right, something roughly like that. Oh yeah. I think that's pretty much what we're talking about. We just need some screws. That was going to be M2 by 6, which I've got right here. This is satisfying. We've got the next part printing and we've got this one. It seems working. I don't want to jump the gun here, but this is looking good so far. If anybody has ideas for like other streaming services we could try, like cause YouTube certainly doesn't have you know, isn't like perfect, obviously, but um, like if there are any small ones you know of that would be interesting to try out. I do use Twitch for the Senrio related streams. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting. It's got its own different quirks. It doesn't store archives, which makes that a little hard because I like how people can go back and interact with the archives in much the same way that you can interact with the real stream on YouTube. And so I've been working around that with my employer, at least for those streams, by using, there's a little goober of plastic in here I'm trying to get rid of. Um, I've been working around that problem by just, like they're paying for a Vimeo account that I use to manually upload the archives, but that's kind of expensive and, like I could do that, like, especially now that I have this Patreon campaign, like I could, I could use that to help fund a video archive if we did want to move off of YouTube, but. Yeah, it is kind of a bad situation having it be like the de facto home for video creators these days and it being really hard to actually get any kind of consistent, like, you know, you get like, I mean, it reminds me like of forums and, you know, kind of other aspects of internet culture, right? Like you do something that's against the terms of service and you get, you know, banned by moderator and then you talk to the moderator and you get that reversed. And like there are elements of that that are present now, but like the stuff that's been happening on YouTube lately is more like they kind of have terms, but they also kind of have a bunch of like secret heuristics that maybe they don't even fully understand because they're part of like somebody's partially debugged like machine learning project. And I don't know, like having, having this algorithm make decisions that then you don't have any recourse to go back and you know, even figure out, like they don't even necessarily know how the decisions got made. Like they could debug their model, but they won't give you that information because they want to keep the model itself fairly secret. Screws are having a little bit of trouble lining up. I'm wondering if maybe they just need to be longer. Oh, this is not quite clearing that tantalum capacitor on that side. Maybe I just need to push this more into place. Or I could just use longer screws. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sodium says Google is really incredibly bad at transparency. Yeah, that's like my main problem with them actually. Because like they do a lot of great stuff. I just really hate how secretive they are about it all. Um, like, I don't know. I mean, I have people. I mean, I've been in this position a while of having friends that work at companies where they just can't really tell people in general and a lot of times even their friends what they're working on. And, but we have to like trust them that it's still the right thing to, for them to be doing. And I'm skeptical of that logic. I think that that often is not entirely the whole picture. Cause like a lot of the, oh, I think that beep means that the bolt is done. I have to go check that out. 
Because I think a lot of the time, you know, it is possible to do what they're saying they want to do in the open. It just means that they don't end up with quite the power differential that they would like to have after it's all said and done. And that seems kind of sketchy to me, especially if the management is kind of planning that intentionally and, but then, you know, giving their engineers some different story that they can use to feel good about their work without thinking so much about how it serves to concentrate power even more. Let's see if M2 by 8 is too long. I hope it's not too long. These seem like they're going to be too long, but let's just try them anyway. I mean, it's also fine if they don't necessarily fit super tight. Because this is just a wiring cover, really. I think these screws might have the wider screw heads that I was worried about, though, which might not fit at all. Oh, maybe these just barely fit. The screw heads, rather. I don't know about the actual bracket. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people doing things that, at Google that are really interesting. I just don't like how that has, like, for that to exist, it has to exist under this blanket of secrecy. And I think, you know, you see that at Apple, and and there's this kind of company culture of, well, you know, if I want to do the cool things that I'm doing, if I want to work on technology that impacts this many people, then I have to put up with their secrecy. But... I don't know. I don't think it actually serves anyone except for the people who are already in power. Oh yeah, Alfie also adds, uh, but at the same time their income is based on, uh, well let me back up so that I get this first half of that. So Google is weird. It's got many departments of, ma of many people working on very cool projects. But at the same time, their income is based on driving people toward clicking on certain things, and so I can't trust most Google products for that reason. <laughs> Apple's a whole other kettle of fish. I'm pretty convinced it's now a study of how awful can we make a laptop that Alfie will still buy. <laughs> yeah, Apple's certainly got kind of a, a little bit of a personality crisis at the moment. I'm not really quite sure how they're, who they're being, who they're making things for, I guess. These screws look like they were way too long, but maybe they're fine. I think this is feeling pretty good. I think we might unintentionally have the hot glue acting as another layer of washer, but that's, you know, whatever works. As long as it looks good and is reliable, it doesn't necessarily need to match the CAD model 100% in this particular project. That's what we got. I'm gonna use the spudger to make sure there are no wires or bits of hot glue hanging out where they shouldn't be. That's pretty normal. Those wires were not really stuck. That's good. Yeah, it looks like all the components that need to have room have room. Cool. Let's see how the printer's doing. That one's getting started. Okay, well, I'm gonna go get that bolt and tell it to start printing the nut that goes with it.
it's already got such a great texture. Yeah, okay, so now the little printer is printing the nut that goes with this one. <laughs> Here's the 200% knurling nut model. And 300%, but the stubbier version. So, yeah, it's a nice print. This printer does all right, considering, you know, it's set to go pretty fast right now. But yeah, a couple of little blobbies here, but overall quite a good print. I'll know how the, good the threads are once I have the nut that goes with this. <laughs> All right, well, I mean, it's a little tempting to test the camera. Um, haven't really changed much other than, well, we blocked it for light. I guess we could test it for light leaks. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, US Water Rocket says time for a close up. Yeah, maybe we should. Um, well, so there's this thing, which we were just looking at. Maybe we'll go back to that. I think, I think they were probably talking about this bolt, though. Let's get a little more room for this camera. <clears throat> yeah, so <laughs> this is the 200% knurling nut. Quite satisfying. Yeah, this is definitely one of those toys where like the more you play with it, the more satisfying it gets, since the, the threads kind of smooth up a little bit. That's nice. I, just, oh. I think it also adds slightly different smoothness depending on the orientation of the nut, but I think both orientations are pretty smooth right now. Let's try that. This one's not quite as smooth. Very fun. And then 300%. Still warm off the printer. Oh, and Ryan is asking if there's a URL for this. Yes, let me find this. Um, I think if we search for neural bolt, this, yeah. This is it. So if you go to Thingiverse, it's thing1460364, or search for knurling bolt and nut. So yeah, this little one is printed at 200%, and then this is 300%. I think normally this is like an M15 bolt. Yeah, bolts are M15. <laughs> ah, yes, so. And the knurl is very satisfying, like it is nice and sharp. So like, ooh, yeah. Let me have to get a neck massager. All right, well maybe, um, I think I'll need to wrap this stream up pretty soon, but uh, before doing that, I think I'll turn on this camera and we can just take a look at what it's given us so far. Make sure it's still happy. Um, thank you for doing that. I will just be, I think I'm out of network ports right now. I need to, I got an upgrade for the switch over here. I just haven't installed it because the wiring is terrible, but I no longer, no longer quite deal with the eight port switch over here. Yeah, let me steal the cable from the other side of the room. That totally kind of fits. I mostly just need this to start the software on there. Like, um, and then I want SDI video. 
Video cable. And five volts for the Raspberry and 12 volts for the camera plus gimbal. Hey, you too, go. Well, camble, camera, gimbal, and light are all being powered off the 12 volts, rather. Tuco, I hear you so much. What's it about? What's it about, little guy? You wanna play? I'm setting up a camera, then maybe we can play on camera. Um, I think we just need power. Gimbal's coming to life. So it's stabilized and we have video now. Um, and if I run a script on the Raspberry Pi, we can control it with the Xbox remote. Let's have this camera get a close up on that camera. Okay, I'm gonna start the script on the Raspberry Pi and then disconnect the network cable because it's kind of in the way right now. Um, I guess we can switch to the other composite. What do you want, boy? I see what you want, Tuco. There's a bolt on the floor. Ow. Hey, Tuco, is this what you wanted? That's a big yes. <sighs> Must be like having a kid who's really into Legos. Unplug this since it's running in screen. <laughs> Trying to switch the skin blood to the mode where we have left right control. I still need to fuss around with the gimbal software some, but here we go. A little hard to aim it with the controller the way it's set up right now still. Hey, Tuco. Can I get this any closer to the edge? Hey, little cat. I see you. Tuco is not where this base can see him. He's actually sitting on top of the CAD computer right now, which is still kind of slightly disassembled. Raspberry Pi was about to lose power. There we go. Ha! 
That's a better shot. Okay. So the jerkiness you're seeing right now is mostly due to the controls. Like, like that little bit of wobble and overshoot as I was stopping, that probably was the gimbal's control loop. But like the abrupt starting and stopping is entirely just the joystick here having a inconveniently sized dead zone for this application. That's me moving, I think, as fast as it'll let me go, side to side. And up and down it goes actually quite rapidly, like, it's easy to lose control of it up and down. So some turn tuning in the firmware for sure. <laughs> Let's try uh, wobb wobbling this a little bit. Kind of see how that responds. I mean, I don't expect this to be having a lot of vibration. It'll probably be more like, you know, kind of slow moving and kind of like sagging and being at the wrong angle and that kind of stuff. And I, so that's kind of what I hope this gimbal will protect uh, or will correct for. <laughs> Robert says a blue coax cable looks really weird to me. I expect blue co blue cables to be USB or Ethernet, not or USB three or Ethernet, not coax. Yeah, I got a few that were color coded for different inputs on my streaming rig, and then ended up getting a couple of extras because they were nice cables. But yeah, they are a little strange. Are we gonna get a better view, or I'm just limited by how long all my wires are? Right now, the three wires I have going to this externally are video, 12 volts, and 5 volts. The 5 volt wire is unfortunately short. I could easily put a USB battery pack in there, but then I would need to restart the Raspberry Pi. idea of what flying over there might look like. All right, well, that's pretty much the last thing I had in mind to fuss with. I might take a quick look at the status of the 3D printer, but I think this is about what I had in mind accomplishing for this section of the stream. Yeah, the little knurling nut is printing, and that is the capstan we designed. Seems to be printing nicely so far. It's still probably got another like hour or so to print though. So I think I will do some human things like possibly going to get groceries. <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully if I've got the energy later today and I'm not just like sick, then I'll try to do some more streaming. As usual, it's nice to share this stuff and it's nice to, uh, you know, to have the combination of an interactive experience of making this stuff together and a good way of collecting footage and audio and stuff that I'll edit together later. I'm just going to go back to the cat camera, but maybe I have to plug it back in first. Since the, uh, the work in progress cat camera is still a little bit hard to move compared to this one. There's Tuco enjoying the half disassembled CAD machine as I have a cardboard box taking up its former spot in that rack. So I'll see you guys next time. Happy hacking.